made it work, Matt. I always have to make sure that I, I mute it on Facebook, otherwise I get a weird loop thing. So, um, okay, I'll get started then. Um, welcome everybody to, uh, this is Sustainable Red Bank. Uh, if this is your first time, this is a monthly program. It's on the third Tuesday of every month uh, presented by the Red Bank Public Library and also the Environmental Commission of Red Bank um, helps us put together a lot of these programs. Um, if you haven't been to the Red Bank Library, we have a lot of stuff that's available to you, even if you don't live, work, or go to school in Red Bank, in which case, if you do, if you are one of those three, you can get a library card. But we do still have a ton of stuff that's still available publicly. All of our programming is open to everyone. Um, we are now fully open. We have uh, Wi-Fi all over our, all over our uh, property. And uh, as Kim was mentioning, we also have a seed library, which is something that we're really pushing right now. It's in his second year. It's available to everyone. It's totally free. You can basically take as many seeds as you want. Um, we've got a lot of varieties this year. It's been really popular. Um, and it's uh, vegetables, herbs. Uh, we focus on food plants, native plants, and pollinator plants. Also, if you can hear screaming, I'm sorry, it's my son in the next room. So I'm gonna try and focus and not let that drown me out, but he's having trouble going to bed. Um, so, um, but yeah, so if anyone wants to use the seed library, it's open to everyone. You don't need to return seeds. If you want to donate seeds, we'd really appreciate it. Um, but if you're inspired at the end of this and you want to, uh, to get some seeds and do some gardening, um, feel free to stop by because all of that's free. Um, so this week uh, we've done, uh, so I don't think I see, this actually looks like it's an entirely new crowd, which is great. Um, we've done some of these programs in the past. We did one with NJ Audubon where they talked a little bit about native plants, um, but considering how important that is for, um, for, the, for the environment and for the wildlife in the area and for pollinators and everything, um, we thought we would do one specifically with the Native Plant Society in New Jersey. Um, and uh, Kim generously agreed to, uh, to do this program for us. Uh, she's the chapter leader of the newly formed Monmouth chapter of the Native Plant Society of NJ. Um, after earning a degree in horticulture, Kim spent her career in the pharmaceutical in industry, but never stopped gardening, designing gardens, and learning. She is a lifelong lover of perennial gardens in the English style, but she changed everything about how she gardens once she learned about the importance of native plants to the health of our environment. Uh, she hopes you will enjoy, uh, she hopes you will join NPSNJ Monmouth to learn more together through the year. And uh, without further ado, I will hand it off to Kim. Uh, just a note to everyone, if you do have a question, please keep yourself on mute and put it into the chat and we'll pause here and there and I'll read out uh, any questions you might have. Uh, and feel free to unmute if Kim asks a question directly. Thank you, Matt. That was very helpful. And thank you everyone for coming tonight. I appreciate being part of this, um, this opportunity to talk about another sustainability subject that's really important, um, native plants and how we can create wildlife preserves in our own home gardens. So um, it's now really within our power to create wildlife preserves in our own backyards. And that is, um, I'd like to start with this quote, which was very important to me. Uh, Matt mentioned that I changed everything about the way I garden when I read a book in 2013 or 14 by Doug Tallamy. And Doug Tallamy, many of you may already know, is a professor at the University of Delaware. And he's an entomologist and he studies the relationship between native plants and, um, and insects and also the uh, relationship between insects and birds. So that it's a, uh, um, he, he's promoting the use of native plants to create habitat across the United States. So this is a quote from his first book. Uh, it, it is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing, which is to make a difference. In this case, the difference will be to the future of biodiversity, to the native plants and animals of North America and the ecosystems that sustain them. So really when we choose native plants for our gardens, we're choosing life for the wildlife that surrounds us. 
So I'm going to start with a, um, a question, what is a native plant? And I recognize that some of you on the call uh, will already know the answer to this. But before I define native plants, I'd like to just point out the photograph, which is uh, a picture of a, na a natural landscape in the Pine Barrens. And it's quite beautiful, I think. I mean, I look at that and I see the swaths of different plants running through it, the different colors and textures. It's quite gorgeous. And it's something that a gardener like Piet Udolf might have done. Uh, he's the, one of the architects, landscape architects for the High Line. And it, it really is fantastically beautiful. If you haven't visited the Pine Barrens recently, it's, an, it's a treasure, a New Jersey treasure. Um, but uh, the point of this photograph is to show that native plants can be beautiful, but they are identified as plants that have evolved in a specific place, in this case, the pine barrens, over thousands of years with the other plants and insects and animals around them. So right alongside all the wildlife that is evolving, the plants evolved at the same time, and they have symbiotic relationships as a result. It's fun for me to think about what my yard might have looked like before development came in, before the houses and the roads and the driveways and the tennis courts and everything were put in place. My yard and the surroundings probably looked pretty much like this, like this photo and yours too. So the more we can bring it back to something that resembles this, or at least uh, bring our yards back to uh, some combination of plants that might have occurred here naturally, the better off we'll be and the better off our, our wildlife will be. So native plants are really, really important. And before I go on, I just wanna share with everyone, I'm gonna start with this, uh, quick definition of native plants and why they're important, and then get into five simple steps that you can take um, to, to, to get into native plants, to take the first steps into incorporating them into your own yard. So thinking about why they're important, there are lots of different reasons why they're important, but the overriding one is that native wildlife species evolved at the same time as the native plants, and they depend on them then for food and shelter and native and nesting sites. And here are some of the relationships you can see. A uh, hummingbird with a columbine. This is the wild columbine. It's the one that is orange and yellow. The columbines that you might have in your yard oftentimes are pink or purple. And uh, those are not natives, but this one that is orange and yellow is. Uh, this, uh, the center photo is Asclepius. It's a milkweed, butterfly milkweed, and it's one of the uh, plants that sustains monarch butterflies. And the, uh, the butterfly on the right is the monarch, and it's on goldenrod. So one of the most important reasons we want to go native and incorporate native plants into our yards is for the butterflies and the moths. And uh, the reason that, th that it's so very important is because um, their larvae are specialists. And what that means is that most butterflies and moths, their larvae will only eat one species, sometimes two, sometimes a small group of species. They can't eat anything else. So serving them uh, alien plants uh, is like serving a plate of wood chips to somebody who's starving. It's impossible for them to eat it. And that is because of leaf chemistry. If you think about it, every single plant on the planet has slightly different, every single species of plant on the planet has a slightly different leaf chemistry. And we can demonstrate that to ourselves by thinking about leafy greens, you know, for example, um, romaine lettuce or iceberg lettuce versus kale. Both are leafy greens, but they taste very, very different. And you may have a strong preference for one or the other. And this is true for 
butterflies and moths larvae as well. They only can eat certain plants. So we know this about the monarch that's been very well publicized that they eat only milkweed, but it's actually true for almost all butterflies and moths um, larvae as well. So um, it's really important that we grow the native plants that these uh, that these butterflies and moths, moths can actually eat. The other reason to go native is to feed the birds. Uh, nesting birds need those insect larvae in order to feed their babies. Uh, if you think about babies, we wouldn't feed our own babies rough seeds and nuts because they couldn't digest them. They couldn't swallow them and they couldn't digest them. They can't do that until we're older, until we mature. The same thing is true with, with birds. Uh, when birds are babies, they need those soft uh, insect larvae to be able to um, get them down their throat and, and uh, digest them. So uh, birds can't sustain themselves just on the seeds from our feeders. It's impossible because they can't feed their babies. And in, in addition to that, their own diets, their adult diets are largely insect as well. So even though our birds love to visit our feeders and eat, um, eat, eat the nuts and the seeds that we put there, uh, they can't sustain themselves on that. It would be like us saying, we're only gonna eat vegetables, we're only gonna be vegetarians. Some of us do that, but most of us like to balance our diets by also eating meat, vegetables and meat. Same thing with birds. They, they like the seeds, but they also like insect materials. Chickadees like this one um, uh, really uh, consume about half of their diet in winter uh, with insect either larva or egg cases. And in the summertime, it's as much as 80% of their diet is insect related. So how does that relate to native plants? Well, it relates to native plants because native plants support 35 times as many butterfly and monarch caterpillars as non-natives, 35 times. That's on average. They support three times as many, uh, in general, plant-eating insects as non-natives. And one example, example of this is something that you might be familiar with, which is uh, dogwoods. So our native dogwood is, um, is uh, Cornus florida. And Cornus florida is the native dogwood that's been around forever. There, the Cornus florida supports 117 different species of butterfly and moth larva, which is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, and it's more amazing when you compare it to Cornus cusa, which is the Korean dogwood. And if you look around in your own landscape or in public landscapes at libraries or parks, you will often see uh, Cornus cusa. It's a very, very uh, commonly used landscape plant. But guess how many larva species it supports in the United States? Anybody want to guess? We only have a few people on. We could actually guess out loud. Anybody have a guess? Zero? Zero is right. It is exactly right. It supports zero species. So that's that's the main um, rationale for using native species versus uh, alien species from Europe or Asia or elsewhere. Another reason is to counter habitat loss. And this picture, I love this picture, but it's uh, pretty extreme. I would guess that most of our are Neighborhoods don't look exactly like this, but maybe out in the Midwest or a newer neighborhood it would look like this. And it's all pave, pavement uh, and lawn. And the pavement is obviously not a habitat for any wildlife of any kind, but guess what? Neither is the lawn because the lawn is made up of usually one or maybe two grass, uh, grass types species. Oftentimes those grass species are not native to the area they're used in. And we manage them in ways that make it really not appropriate for habitat. So 
we mow it, we mow it down very low. That means it never is allowed to flower. And since it can't flower, it's not any good for pollinators. And then we dump on tons and tons of pesticides. So that's all obviously dangerous for the um, insects themselves, but also for us. So uh, lawn is not the answer to habitat, that's for certain. Um, if we think about what percent I'm going to ask another, ask you to put this in chat again. What percent of the total landmass of the United States um, in the lower 48 states, what percent of the landmass has been modified in some way for human use? Anybody have any guesses? 75%. 75 percent. I saw him, by the way. Hi, Kim. <laughs> 75%, anybody else have any other guesses? It's actually between 95 and 97%. Think about that. 95, we have modified between 95 and 97% of the habitat of this country. And uh, that is in the lower, lower uh, 48, not including Alaska, Hawaii. Uh, that's a little frightening because uh, when we think about it, it's largely made up of housing developments, pavement, um, agriculture. And uh, um, it's interesting to think about pavement, I mean, excuse me, agriculture, because agriculture, like lawns, is generally um, one crop, you know, covering a large area. So again, not habitat. Uh, for many insects or birds. And regarding the pavement, we pave, the pavement that we have in existence right now is 43,000 square miles, 43,000 square miles of pavement, pavement in this country. And that's the size of the entire state of New Jersey times five and a half. Five and a half times the size of the state of New Jersey is also already under pavement. Oh, wow. It's quite quite huge. And um, so the proposition here is that we each take this challenge and start building habitat in our own backyard. That's the whole premise of the uh, the whole the home um, homegrown national park movement, and uh, it's it's a great concept because we know from research that the smaller the habitat, the smaller the number of species that can, can survive there. So the more and more we compress the native habitats that are out there, the fewer species that will in the long run survive. So habitat's really important. Another reason is for the native plants themselves. We all have invasive plants in our yards right now. I know I do. And, um, and those invasive plants like Norway maples, uh, like Bradford pears, they escape into the wild and they either crowd out other native plants or they shade them out because they're, they leaf out earlier than the native uh, plants do. And things like this, trout, trout lily uh, or erythronium, oops, sorry, erythronium, uh, tend to get shaded out because the Norway maples leaf out much earlier. And the last reason is because natives are really beautiful. This is uh, the New York Botanical Garden up in Queens. They have a large native plant garden. It's quite gorgeous, as you can see. This was taken, taken I think, in the first week of June a few years ago. And uh, this is their woodland garden but they also have a large meadow, meadow garden of natives too. And it's really spectacular. So it shows you what you can do with natives in your, maybe not to this scale, this would be a little tough, but uh, there are beautiful things you can do in your yard. So before we go on, uh, Matt, do you want to uh, see if anybody has any questions? So we're clearing this chat, let me see. No, it looks like we're all good. Does anyone have anything? <clears throat> um, oh, uh, the New York 
botanical garden is in the Bronx, just in case anybody uh, goes to the wrong borough. <laughs> You're right. Thank you. That was a, a good mistake. And thanks for the correction. I appreciate Thank it. You. You're absolutely I, right. I have a question. So when you say native, is are you speaking about like New Jersey native versus Pennsylvania native, or is it like East Coast native concept? So um, that's a complicated uh, question to answer, but I'll give it a shot. So thinking about the definition being plants that have evolved in a place, right, over a long period of time, they their range is it, it varies based on the plant. So some plants might be might have only a very small range. For example, there are some plants in the pinelands that only exist there. And then other plants may be native, but might extend clear up the East Coast, you know, from Maine to say Georgia. So it really depends on the plant. So um, I'm gonna give some resources in a few minutes to show how do you figure out what's native for our area? And, um, and it takes a little research and uh, time to get to know the palette of plants you have available to you in our area. We live in a coastal plain. And so uh, with pretty sandy soil, Lori, I know you're up in Edison, so it might be slightly different. But, um, but uh, our area, Monmouth County and Ocean County, and the pine barrens have similar plants, a similar plant palette. Did I answer the question, Lori? Yeah, so it's, uh, it sounds like big picture and little picture of you could find plants, right, just in, in an area versus ones that are sustainable on the Eastern seaboard and, you know, looking into all of that. So that that's a good answer, it makes sense, right. thank you. Okay, so how do you get started? Now, let's say you're convinced and you really want to use native plants in your own garden, uh, how do you get started? So what I, I think I have found is that it can be very, very complicated, but it doesn't have to be. So it depends on who you talk to. Sometimes if you listen to enough people who are native plant enthusiasts, if they're really into it, you'll feel intimidated because uh, some folks are very much purists they only want to use certain types of plants from certain provenance, you know, uh, and uh, it gets really tough. Be and you might just throw, up, throw in the towel and say, oh gosh, this is way too much for me. But I don't think it needs to be that way because my philosophy is anything you do, any native you plant is better than no native. And, um, and so just start, just start small. Um, I'm going to go through five steps, starting small, what that might mean, focusing on species, replacing invasives, reducing and managing your lawn, and planting an oak, which is my last thought that I'd like to send you home with. So starting small, what do I mean by that? The first thing you need to do is just kind of survey your garden. I, you know, Take a notebook, walk outside, walk around your yard see what you have. And if you don't know what you have, there are some ID apps out there that are really helpful. Um, like on your, on your smartphone, you can use PlantNet or iNaturalist to help you identify what you already have. And um, you might find that you already have natives in your yard. For example, almost all of us probably have violets in our yard somewhere. And those are natives and there are state plants. So, um, and they are the larval uh, source for uh, fritillaries, butterflies. So great plant. And if they happen to be in some bed of yours, don't yank them out, uh, preserve them. They're, they're great natives. So you might find that you already have some on your property. And it's good to know that because then you can build around them. If you have them or you don't have them, then I would suggest going to use this brochure called Going Native. Uh, at least for those of us who are in Monmouth and Ocean Counties, this is a really great brochure. And Lori, there's a new one of these being uh, printed right now for more Northern gardens. So it has sl a slightly different palette of plants. 
But uh, this, this particular brochure is printed by the Barnegat Bay Watershed. I have it in a PDF form and I'm happy to send it to anybody who wants it. Just put it into the chat that you'd like me to do that and I'm happy to do it. You, you'll have to give me your email address in order to do that. Um, it, this brochure looks like it's a one pager. It's not, it's six pages and inside it has all kinds of great information about trees and shrubs and herbaceous perennials that you can select and it tells you a lot about them, why they're good, uh, you know, what the conditions are that, that are needed for them, et cetera. We've been at the Native Plant Society trying to encourage uh, local nurseries to carry the plants that are in this brochure because if, if they did, it'd make it very easy on you. But all uh, nurseries do not have a great selection of native plants. Those of us who are enthusiasts end up going to lots of plant sales and plant swaps, and we order from native plant nurseries online. But I've chosen a few native plants to show you here that usually are, you usually are able to find in a local nursery. So we'll look at them now. The first one I picked out is cardinal flower. That's the tall red flower here. It's quite big. Uh, on average, I'd say it's, you know, maybe four feet tall. Sometimes if it's happy, it gets taller than that. Uh, but I love this flower. It, it, it blooms in the late uh, summer and it attracts loads of hummingbirds. They love it. So they're always flitting around when this is in bloom. It's a wonderful plant. Uh, Black Eyed Susan is the yellow flower below it. And that's Rudbeckia fulgida. There's another Rudbeckia, which is also a native called Rudbeckia herta, H-I-R-T-A. This one is fulgida and it probably is a cultivar. This is in my own garden. Um, and this one is probably a cultivar called uh, Goldsturm. Goldsturm has been around. It's a selection that was found in somebody's garden. And then we'll talk about what cultivars are in a minute, but uh, it's been reproduced many, many, many times over. And it's a good sturdy plant. This plant has nice, strong stems. It stays up all winter because that's something that you learn to do as a native plant garden is leave your stems up all winter. And in the, uh, in the winter, birds still visit it to peck out the seeds from the seed heads. That's a great plant and it blooms for a long period of time. This is another plant that you might find in your local nursery and it's called butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. And it's a great plant too. It's a little more airy. It uh, has a color that I don't think there's another plant out there that has this color. It's a really vibrant orange, very beautiful. And it's a uh, larval host for monarch butterfly larva. So it's an important plant to have in your garden. And this one is great blue lobelia or lobelia syphilitica. This one is also large, large-ish, maybe two and a half feet tall. It's, it's well-mannered, but it does recede, recede itself. So if you have it in a place it likes to be, you'll get lots more plants. It's easy to manage. You can pull them out and move them around whenever you want to. And it has this gorgeous blue flower. So it's a, it's a great plant too. Um, I really like this one and it is a larval host for pink washed looper moth, although I can't claim that I've ever seen one. So pink washed looper moth. And this is one you're probably familiar with, purple cone flower, Echinacea purpurea. And uh, it's a great plant for bees and also the finches in my yard love it. I leave the seed heads up just like I do with Rebecca through the winter and the finches come. As long as there are seeds in this, they're picking them out one by one. They really, really like it. You'll see in the background here, this is in my garden on the left, um, the background there, you'll see a bright red 
cone flower. That is a cultivar, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The, the grasses that are up against the deck are a uh, little blue stem, and that's a wonderful plant too. Really, it's just such beautiful color all season long. In the fall, it turns like a purplish, purple blue color and throws up seed heads, and it's really lovely. And it also will stand up all winter long. Uh, even with heavy snow, it's very resilient. And this one is New England Aster. So you might even have these in your yard already. The picture on the left is what it looks like in a natural setting. And um, it's kind of rangy and floppy. And here it's shown with, uh, um, with goldenrod. I'm not sure which, which variety that is which species that is, but I don't let it grow like that in my garden. What I do instead is I do a thing called Chelsea chop and about, uh, about this time of year, uh, toward maybe another week or so, I just chop the whole thing halfway down and then let it grow again till July 4th and then chop it again, halfway down. And then the, the plants are nice and compact and they don't flop and you get this gorgeous blue um, mass in your garden. Very, very nice. Now, this one is the uh, larval host for pearl crescent butterflies, so it's also a great plant to have. I will say, unfortunately, that many of these plants are deer food, as are all of our plant, uh, plants, and um, so if you can exclude uh, deer from the areas where you want to plant these, it's really important to do so. Uh, native plants are no more resilient than the, the uh, alien plants we've been using uh, to deer browse. And the only things that can, the only plants that usually survive are ones that are very uh, smelly. You know, they have nice odor to them or are fuzzy. Some, plant, uh, the, some deer don't like the fuzzy leaves on certain plants. So, um, so that's the sad truth about deer. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? I will send um, Kim a list of any of the people who want the going native brochure at the end of the class. Um, but otherwise, I'll leave it for questions. All right. Thank you. Um, OK, so my second step or suggestion for how to get started with natives is to Focus on species, but don't let perfection be the enemy of good. So I'm going to explain what I mean by that a little bit. When we talk to native native plant enthusiasts, most will tell you that you that you should or have to um, focus only on straight species plants. So I want to talk about that a little bit. This, by the way, that photo is Monarda. Um, it's, it's a, that is a native also. So what is a straight species? A straight species, if let's look first at the plant tags uh, on the left where you see it says coneflower, echinacea, purpurea, white swan. So coneflower is the common name. That's the name that everybody throws around easily. And the echinacea purpurea below that is the scientific name. The first word in the scientific name is the genus or genus. And the second word is purpurea, that's the species. And that's, a, that's, a, that's the way it always is. You will always see genus, species, genus, species. And um, on every tag, the species is not capitalized. It's just the format that, that is used. If the name has something after the species in quotes, that's the cultivar name. And it indicates that it's not a straight species, it's a cultivar. Now, what is a cultivar? A cultivar is a, a handy shortening of two words, which is cultivated variety. And they come from lots of different origins. Some of them come from selections. They're just, you know, oh, somebody noticed this particular one in the garden and thought it was great. And took it out of the garden and then started propagating it. Um, others are more intentional genetic manipulation of one type or another. 
So um, the the cultivars are all populate are all propagated vegetatively, and what that means is, without going into the details of how that's done, it's not done by seed, and that means that every Echinacea purpurea white swan is going to be identical genetically. So they are identical plants, they're clones. So, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. They can most of the time still reproduce uh, sexually if you, if you let them, right? So uh, there's nothing wrong with that in, in and of itself. Uh, but research has been done recently and it's in progress looking at whether insects like cultivars as much as they like the species. And, in, and it's complicated. Is The answer is it's complicated. Uh, and so I came up by a, um, some of the information on Homegrown National Park. I came up with some guidelines for how to look at this. Because the reality is cultivars oftentimes offer benefits that species plants do not. So, and also the local nursery often carries more cultivars than they do uh, species plants. So here's how to kind of think about it. Straight species are always best, but cultivars can be okay. Uh, and here are some guidelines for that. So you see the plant on the left is a uh, red bud. That's a native plant. However, this is a cultivar of that red of the red bud and it's been selected and propagated to be purple leaved as purple leaves versus the native green leaf. And it's a weeping form. So the form has also been altered. So if you're thinking about what to avoid when you're looking at cultivars, you wanna avoid any leaves that have been made into red or purple leaves. The reason is because the leaf chemistry has been changed. And so the insects don't like that. They don't like the red or purple leaves as much as they like the green leaf. And they're showing this uh, through research at University of Arizona and University of Delaware and at Mount Cuba Center. Mount Cuba Center is doing a lot of trials right now in conjunction with the University of Delaware to determine uh, what the insects prefer. So that's one thing they've come up with, always avoid red or purple leaves. Another thing to avoid is uh, cultivars that advertise they have larger flowers or that have been selected for larger flowers because they tend to um, sacrifice uh, nectar and pollen production uh, when they're creating the larger flowers. And the other one to avoid is double flowers. So, um, and that's because for the pollen and nectar reasons, but also because the actual sexual organs of the flower might be changed in the creation of this double flower. So they're not as um, easily pollinated. The research is showing that it's probably okay to select cultivars that make more compact plants if the plants are smaller. It's probably okay to select those that are more disease resistant those that have an enhanced fall color in their leaves, that's okay because by that time the larvae have finished feeding anyway. So even if they have uh, enhanced fall color, it's probably not gonna affect the insect life. And anything that has an increased berry size is probably okay as well. Uh, the jury is still out on variegation and I put a photo down in the right corner of a variegated leaves for, the, for those of you who might not know what it is. It's a leaf that is green and white. And so far the research is showing that the more varig variegation there is, the less the insects like it, but they still eat it. So yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, I have a couple of variegated leaved natives in my garden that I got before I knew anything about this. And I'll probably leave them because uh, they're better than having an alien plant there. And if, I'm, if I find a, uh, I may later replace them with uh, green leaf varieties. Any questions about that before we move on?
Okay. Uh, number three on my list is replace invasives. So this is an extreme case. Does anybody recognize this, uh, this plant? This is kudzu, kudzu. Kudzu, kudzu basically ate the sow. And uh, I define invasives as non-native plants that spread easily and cause harm to the environment or the economy or to human health. That literally is a house under that kudzu. And uh, it, you can see pictures of this. If you drive down south, you'll see it all over the place. It's a, it's a crazy vine. Believe it or not, I had it in my backyard when I moved to Brielle and I was able to eradicate it. And I have seen it on the, um, the walkway that's in Atlantic Highlands, the one that walks along the, uh, the water there. Um, so it's, it's alive and well in New Jersey, believe it or not. So you have to really be attentive to it. The more we have, the more climate change affects us, the more of this we will have. But right now it's not our worst, um, our worst nightmare. Our worst nightmare is probably Bradford pear. How many of us have, the, have had these in our yards? I know that uh, uh, I have in the past and I currently have a tree in the backyard that's kind of battling out with a Bradford pear at the neighbor's house. So um, Bradford pears are, are really rough on the environment. They, are spread by birds who eat the, eat the uh, berries and then carry them away and drop them everywhere. And, you, and to prove this to yourself, these are about to come into bloom. It's uh, just take a drive along almost any highway. I know that along 195, going out through the Pine Barrens, the Bradford pear is everywhere. Um, it's, if you're gonna, uh, if you have one in these, one of these in your yard that you want to replace, a good replacement is American dogwood. Uh, and there are some um, disease resistant varieties that American dogwood had an anthracnose disease for a while, but there are some disease resistant varieties that are on the market now that are doing very well. And another choice would be amelanch here or service berry. And a third would be red bud. All three would work really well in place of a Bradford pear. Just please don't plant any of these. And if you see them being planted around your neighborhood, you should also uh, try to talk to your town about it or your neighbors. They're rough. Another invasive that we really hate to give up, I know I did, is butterfly bush. Um, butterfly bush, we think we're doing a great thing because it attracts a zillion butterflies and moths and bees, and it does. They love the nectar. But this plant is extremely invasive in woodland areas and in fields, um, along roadways, it's, it's everywhere. And um, so this is one we want to avoid. There are some great natives to, that can substitute for it. One of the favorite is uh, Clethra alnifolia. This is a picture on the right. It's not purple, but it's quite beautiful when it blooms. And it's the larval host for uh, spice bush swallowtail. And here's another invasive you probably have or may have in your yard, uh, Japanese barberry. I know I've had it in my yard in the past. Uh, this one, again, you find it. Uh, I know Lori and I, what, Lori's on the phone call here. We went on a walk in the woods. It was everywhere, this and Euonymus, which I'll show you in a minute. So. All of our parks are uh, loaded with these things in the woodland. Uh, another ch a choice for this one is Virginia Sweet Spire, Itea. There are um, some nice uh, compact Iteas available that, uh, that can keep it quite small or, and, without, and they don't need to be sh shorn or anything. And you get the extra bonus of these beautiful, beautiful flowers. And then there's burning bush, another one. High bush blueberry is a great substitute for that. And when you plant a high bush blueberry, you get spring azure butterflies and also brown, uh, brown elfin butterflies. So you have a, a lot of um, larval, it acts as a larval host. Plus the birds love obviously the blueberries. We love them too, but it's tough to keep them away from the birds. 
And here is English ivy. That's a favorite everywhere. And it is uh, extremely invasive in woodland areas, as is Vinca minor. So uh, some of the green uh, ground covers that we use extensively in our landscapes are, are tough invasives in our woodlands. I use this sensitive fern as a ground cover. It's quite aggressive, so if you want to use it, just know that um, it's going to it's going to cover that ground quickly, and it'll uh, uh, move along outside of where you put it if you're not careful. Uh, and the final one is purple loosestrife. This one is still being sold in nurseries. All of these are still being sold in nurseries. Uh, we've tried to pass a native plant law in New Jersey. Some states have native plant laws that say that nurseries cannot sell certain plants. We should have one in New Jersey, but it has not yet passed. And um, this one is still sold. It's purple loose strife. If you drive through New England, you'll see it in virtually every wetland. It, it just, uh, it's quite beautiful. It's a beautiful purple flower, but it um, chokes out everything else. Uh, a good substitute for that is Blazing Star, Liatris spicata. And now we'll go on to the fourth suggestion, which is reducing and managing your lawn and beds. So um, this is a picture of my yard when I, uh, shortly after we put in a patio on a walkway and I stripped off the turf turned it upside down, mulched it at that point and, um, and planted through the mulch. And that turned into the bed on the right and just, I think this might've been the second year. So it's, it was quite successful doing that. Um, it's important to get rid of as much lawn as you can if you have a chance to do it um, because there's just so many reasons. But um, lot, one reason is all that lawn is uh, a waste of water. It's not habitat for, for any insects. In fact, we usually use pesticides to make sure it isn't. And, um, and we burn up an awful lot of fossil fuel mowing our lawns. Uh, another thing, uh, it's m sort of my personal bugaboo about management is leaf blowers. Because if we think about it, it doesn't make much sense how we generally manage our, our beds. We, uh, if you think about what, a, what happens in the forest, the leaves fall down on the ground and they stay there and then they disintegrate. And that's what feeds the plants is that disintegration of leaf matter. And that's where insects overwinter and where they hide and where they burrow and make nests. So going around with a leaf blower and blowing out every leaf out of every bed is counterproductive for, um, for wildlife. So I would propose that we should try to uh, avoid leaf blowers. I'd be a lot happier too because I wouldn't have to listen to them all day. And, uh, and try to keep the leaves that fall in the beds. Uh, we wanna, for the native plant beds, we want to leave the seed heads up all as long as we can, all winter. And I generally leave everything standing as late as possible. When I do cut the stems, um, I, I cut them long because some bees actually nest in the stems of plants. So when you cut them down to the ground, you're removing the, the bees that have not hatched yet. So there's lots of management techniques and that's an important thing to think about and learn more about as you venture further into native plants. And my final suggestion is- Wait, Hang on, I want to, we, oh, we, sure. actually have, we, we had a question and I, I actually want to ask one too. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Uh, Linda asked uh, what you think about no mo may. No mo may, I'm not sure what we're talking about. Linda, do you want to uh, explain? Well, that was um, suggested by some people that leave the, your grass unmowed during May because there's many insects living and in there and they're feeding on certain 
things in your grass. So they thought that would be better. I don't know. Sounds like a great idea. I haven't I haven't uh, heard that before. Um, it's I think it's the first year that people have been talking about it. Yeah. It's the, it's the law in certain towns. Oh yes, and certain towns have passed laws that say you must leave your lawn unmowed in May. Really? Not, not in my town, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, well thank town. you for bringing that up, Linda, because I I'm not aware of it, and I I'm going to definitely go look it up. Okay. And learn more about it. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, I had a question too about the the lawn the lawn bit. Um, you know, I've got a fair amount of lawn, and I want, you know, I've got two small kids. I I want them to be able to like run around and play on it, so I can't convert it into garden. But I would like, is there an alternative to just kind of like the normal grass that I could put down that they could still run on, and it won't like hurt their feet or anything, and they also won't be like trampling flowers. Mm -hmm. I can start transitioning some of my some of that lawn towards I, I don't know if there's yeah, I don't think that in 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 Europe they use some different plants to do that but I don't think it's very successful here but what I would suggest is that you know we have to get a little more comfortable with our lawns not looking like golf courses um, and if if you let them go in terms of not putting on herbicides, not putting on pesticides, you'll find that you have a lot of uh, native plants that come into the into the lawn and it starts to become a very interesting place. It's still lawn, there's still grass, uh, but it becomes a much more interesting yard. Lots of clover. Uh, I have violets that are in the lawn now. I have sage that has infiltrated in the lawn. And um, it, but you have to be, realize that um, when you look at it, it's not no longer going to look like the golf course. And uh, you can still uh, keep it neat, but, um, but by stopping using pesticides, and I also do not uh, water the lawn at all. So, uh, you know, it does not look like a pristine golf course yard, but we may have to get used to that. So if you don't wanna cut the size of it, uh, at least think about how you're managing it because by doing that, by letting some of those strict thoughts about how lawns should look go, you're nurturing both native plants and insects in a way that helps them create a bit, you know, be able to be able to live. Did that answer your question, Matt? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's, you know, the main thing for us is we don't want, I don't want to build a garden and then have my kids destroy it. Um, right. But, you know, like, uh, but yeah, that we've, we've heard about like clover. I didn't think of the violets, but that's, that's another. That's well, another. the more, the more time that goes by and the more you allow it to happen, you find all kinds of things in your yard that um, you didn't have before. So the one thing that's tough, we have uh, that uh, there are some, uh, alien weeds that are tough that you have to kind of keep after uh, by hand. Uh, but other than that, even there are people out there who are great advocates for dandelions. So, but be prepared to defend yourself against your neighbors with those. <laughs> so the kids, the kids love the dandelions. So I'm on. Yeah, board. they're beautiful. They really are beautiful, uh, but they are pretty aggressive. So, all right. And my last thought is plant an oak. And the only reason I want to leave you with this thought is oak tree supports the more butterfly and moss species than any other native plant. And so if you don't have room for a, an oak in your own yard, maybe you could buy one and contribute it to your local park or some a school or a, a public building, a library, uh, because they are really the best native plant that you can possibly invest in. Um, and that's it for, for my suggestions. Does anybody have any final questions before we move on? Okay. So here are the resources. Uh, these are just a few, of course, but I think if you haven't read one of these books, uh, it, it definitely is the basis for all of this thinking about uh, using natives. 
Bringing Nature Home is Doug Townley's first book, I think. Uh, Nature's Best Hope is more recent. He has a newer one about oak trees in general. Nature's Best Hope is a great book. These books are full of beautiful photography, beautiful photography. Every page practically has beautiful color, color photography and close-ups of insects and birds and, uh, and plants that are tremendous. And then The Living Landscape is a great, uh, a great collaboration between Doug and Rick Dark, who's a landscape architect, and, and it shows lots of landscapes using exclusively native plants. So that's, that's great, a great resource also. The going native brochure I mentioned earlier is really important. And if you're not sure what's invasive, the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team has a do not plant list, which you can consult. One thing I would just say about it, do not, don't assume when you go into a nursery that they're, if they're selling something, it's not, it's not invasive because many of the plants that they sell in local nurseries are invasive. So check it before you plant it. It's a good idea. Um, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Uh, the Monmouth chapter of, new, of the Native Plant Society of New Jersey is brand new, as Matt mentioned. Uh, we just started it up. Our next meeting is June 1st at the Monmouth University Piasecki Hall. I hope I spelled that right. Uh, it's starting at 5.30 p.m. We're going to do a showing, a private showing of Wild in the Garden State, which is a film that was uh, created by Sarah Galloway. Sarah is a filmmaker. She's worked for the American Museum of Natural History for years, making documentaries for them. And she created this documentary on her own property. She and her husband were New Yorkers, they bought a house in uh, Ocean and would come on the weekends and they decided they wanted what they called an ecological garden. So they started researching and learning about native plants and animals and insects. And along the way, she documented their progress. Before this, they knew nothing about gardening, nothing. So the film covers 10 years of their progress in turning their yard into natives. And, um, and it's quite beautiful, it's a beautiful film. It's been in uh, several um, great film festivals recently, including the Princeton Environmental Film Festival. So we're gonna show the film and then Sarah's gonna be there. She'll do a short presentation and answer and uh, do a Q and A. And we're doing this in, in uh, um, conjunction with the Monmouth University Community Gardens. And it's the first, it's gonna be a build as the first in their series of uh, lectures in the garden. So we're excited about it. Also in July, we're gonna have a garden tour of Huber Woods and the Scudder Preserve led by um, Jason Goldman, who's the naturalist at Huber Woods. So uh, I hope you can join us. And if you wanna be on our mailing list, just uh, email me at monmouth at npsnj.org. So thank you very much for your kind listening, a kind attention. I appreciate it. Anybody have anything else they'd like to ask before we move on and close up? Right. I, I, I do have one quick question. Is invasive and non-native, are those two different things? Uh, yeah, they are two different things. So you can have non-native plants that are not invasive. So some great examples of that are um, daffodils. We love daffodils. They're wonderful plants. They're not native. They're all about spring for us. And, uh, and they're fine because they're not invasive. So they're not going to feed our local insects, but there's no reason why you can't have them in your garden. Same thing is with lilacs, for example. Lilacs are not a native plant, um, uh, but they don't, they're not invasive. They don't cause any damage by escaping our yards. So there's no reason you can't have lilacs if you don't want them. Uh, I mean, if you do want them. Lots of plants are like that that are, that are non-native, 
and non-invasive. Hosta, for example, Hosta is not a native, but it is not invasive. So I think there is actually one Hosta that is invasive, but, um, but most are not. So yeah, so there is a difference between those. And that's why it's good to check that list, the invasive plant list, to see which ones actually are invasive. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, well then without further ado, I just wanna say thank you so much. And you guys were very attentive. I appreciate you attending. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and just to reiterate, if anyone does want seeds, we do have a focus on native seeds at the Red Bank Seed Library. We also have at least one of those Douglas Ptolemy books. I think we have Nature's Best Hope and also the gardening one. We've got a whole gardening section um, and a lot of it is New Jersey focused. Um, that's uh, available if you're in Red Bank or in our consortium. If you're in Monmouth County, I'm positive they also have really good stuff too because that we're not part of the same uh, library system. But um, thank you so much to Kim. Uh, just so everyone knows, this thank is you. a monthly thing um, and you're more than welcome to join on any of those. And we would love to see you at uh, future events. So um, thank you guys. Thanks, Kim. Thank, thank you. you, Kim. Thank All you. right, thanks everybody. Great job. Okay. We see did you not soon. Laugh. We did not laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, Tom promised me he me. wouldn't laugh. <laughs> 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 I mean, kept a straight face the whole time, Tom. <laughs> I, think in, I think in July, uh, Sarah is speaking, uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, Sarah is speaking, I think, in July. We're, That's we're right, doing, yeah. We're doing one on um, on air quality in your home next, next month, then the Citizens Climate Lobby, and then uh, we have one for making more bikeable towns coming up and one on foraging coming up. So we've got a whole slate of stuff. Also, uh, if you uh, enjoyed this and want to share it, uh, it'll be on Facebook in like a oh. few minutes. Um, and I will also be posting it to the Red Bank Library YouTube page probably tomorrow or Thursday. Thank you. Thanks for you doing this. Thanks. This is just so much information, so much to think about. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Good job.